from the kitchen of the cabin, a look at the games that made us who we are in Ben and Steve's Advent Calendar. Well, we've made it to uh, December 20th, Ben. Oh, God, it's lovely, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it great that all of that stuff in current affairs has happened and that? Yeah, I was really surprised when what happened on December 18th happened and we were all talking about it. And I couldn't really... believe it. My chin hit the floor, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying if I had like, you know, if I had known I would have bought a certain stock and then I'd be rich today. But yeah, I certainly would have made sure that I did that thing that would have benefited me on the 18th of December, because I know what happened. And how about that sporting event where the team that wasn't supposed to win actually won? Craziness, Steve. They got it out at the last minute in the clutch or something. That's an American term, isn't it? don't know what it means, but... In, 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 in the clutch, yeah. So, like you said, just at the last minute. And, and, and you know, speaking of just at the last minute. Um, the game that you chose today, I've never heard of this. Uh, never have I even heard you mention it. And then it appeared on the list, and I looked it up quickly, and uh, sure enough, it's, uh, it's a trick-taking game. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to talk about why trick-taking games are so great, but you can enlighten me as to why this particular game is so great. Ben, tell us all about Niet. So, yeah, it's a really good trick-taking game because it's a team trick-taking game, which, you know, I, I'm sure there are tons of them, but this is this is a really nice team trick-taking game, but you pick your well, team let me, let me stop you. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me stop you for a second. So when I was growing up, I played a lot of trick-taking games um, like like Euchre and Pinochle and like Bridge is very – I never played Bridge. It's very is that where you Is that where you piss on your hand? So these games are inherently – like team trick taking games like the default i think for these games is always two against two like the the person who's, who's sat opposite to you is on your team and like lately i've been playing loads of trick taking games uh in the modern era like uh like skull king we talked about and um you know scout and so on and so forth whatever the loads of them but they're all they're not there are no teams there are no pairs it's like you against everybody else with the exception of the crew which is like a bit bizarre um so why do you think like now it's like we have to turn it on its head and and call out team trick taking games as the exception rather than the rule? I, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a trend, right? That the, I mean, the trick taking game that I first played was Whist, and that's a that's not a team game, or it, it it doesn't have to be. I didn't play it originally as a team game. It also also can be played as a team game. But for some reason, yeah. for some reason, people don't want to play in teams. They want like all the glory to themselves. Yeah, well, I mean, we could talk about the Americanization of board gaming, Steve. We but, well, you know, we've, we've spoken enough about that. But, see, what's so great about this one is it's a team game, but every round the teams change, right? And so you pick you pick your partner every round. And what's also brilliant is playing with five is great because there can only be two teams. So there's a team of three and there's a team of two. But the team of two, their tricks are worth double. So you have three people and three cards and three opportunities, but they, they have this great advantage of every trick being double. And it's a, it's a really fun, neat, quick trick taking game that feels like a, a finished thought, right? It's, it's, it feels like a new what, what does, type of trick taking this- game. What does this game have to do with like cogitations uh, made in Helsinki? Um, Finn, Finn, think, think, Finn. So you said finished thought. Right, brilliant. You're brilliant. Thank Thanks. You. Great. Thank I think the fucking audience are loving this. Yeah. Patreon.com slash 5G for D. Just, you know, there are a lot of trick taking games and they, they seem to be sort of, they seem to be sort of, adaptation little tweaks on a central idea this feels different actually yet feels different and you know the the version i have which is the yellow version which has the 
the pretty animals dressed as communists is also, I mean, I'm not massive on charmingness, but, you know, communist animals, Steve, you know what I mean? Does this game have any theme to speak of? No, not at all. It's a trick-taking game. It is a it is a game that could be played with, uh, apart from there are doubles of cards and things, it could be played with a, no, with a couple of decks of cards. But that doesn't matter. I mean, these I wonder, games, these card why, games are not supposed to be thematic, right? Yeah, I mean, I still, I still like wonder like why they come up with these like whimsical premises. I mean, a, a regular deck of cards was always enough for me back in my day. And then we play like, uh, was it Hung- Hungry Monkey, which I think is brilliant, by the way. We should talk about it at some point. And like, it tries to have a theme. I don't, I don't even remember what it is. Like, crew kind of not crew. Uh, I mean, like, crew has a theme. Um, probably doesn't need to. Um, I was thinking of Scout, which. Like, you forget the theme, like, two seconds after you start playing yep. it. Um, what was the other one? Uh, spicy, I think. Uh, is it Spicy? Yeah. Yeah, that one is super good, and the theme has nothing to do with it. And yet, they're, they're always trying to, like, paper paper on this, like, I don't know, this whimsical premise. Maybe, maybe it's just to sell copies. I don't know. I mean, it's something about... I, I think you need to have this whimsical premise to make it a hobby game, right? To appeal to hobby game players i know that and this is terrible and it shouldn't make a difference and i always rail against it but i'm such a hypocrite i know that if i that if i played a game that had just a normal standard deck of cards i'd feel less attracted to it i feel like i feel like um that because it has its own particular theme and own particular style of cards and own particular art style that it feels like it sits more comfortably within the hobby game area for me and i know that's facile and stupid but it is what it is yeah i mean we're we're all like suckers for these kinds of things these the um like the um what say like the commodification of, of the hobby you know I, I guess you're right i would rather play with something that's like pretty and these games all they lend, lend, lend themselves to, like with unique pretty decks of cards and diversity diversity is great you know like having different 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 suits and different i don't know creatures on the cards whatever maybe, maybe part of the hobby is it's like taking you away from like the humdrum of your daily life and actually now that i think about it um there are certain connotations that a normal deck of cards has that are, are probably like negative when opposed to the board gaming hobby like a deck of cards reminds me of gambling and i don't feel when i'm playing board games like i feel i don't gamble anymore i I used to actually i used to to gamble like recreationally and it's like a different it's a a different feeling different scene different totally different thing and i I guess maybe it's for the best that they're separated yeah and it feels like i I don't know what it is i I don't think gaming is particularly um gatekeepy in many ways board gaming at least but there is this sort of feeling that if you if you want to sort of be in the hobby, though, you've got to play the games. You've got to... And I, I, I mean, one thing I do like about having these sort of themed games that shouldn't have themes that could be just played with a deck of cards is that you should buy the game, right? You should pay the designer for their intellectual rigour and, and the joy that they give you through their hard work and thought, right? And having it like that is a, is a way to say is to give the game designer remuneration for something clever no yeah sure but i mean doesn't it doesn't it also make it seem a bit more like juvenile that we're like both in our mid-40s and we play games with like cute animals on on the cover of the boxes whereas you know like a deck of cards that seems somehow like adult even like masculine a little bit you know it it evokes you know dark rooms in, in in basements uh, with people smoking and like playing for real stakes, that kind of thing. Whereas there was this, you know, it's like sort of like for kids. Why am I yeah, wrong? Yeah, and I, I, well, the thing is, that's it, right? Superficially, it seems to be, and I think that that's the thing about board gaming, is so many games are themed around things that are ostensibly childish. And yet, once you start wrangling with the mechanisms of these games, once you start dealing with what they are as actual sort of mechanical demonstrations of an art form you realize actually these aren't things for kids necessarily there there is no sort of 
lower or upper age limit on playing games. The mechanisms speak to something very core about humans, I think. We want to solve these issues in our recreation. And the the little pictures fundamentally get ignored at the end, and they might just be a little candy-coated shell to help us get into the meat of what the game is. Yeah, and I agree with you, um, but it's also like a very intellectual sort of take. How do you how do you convince people? How do you like get them past? Like assuming, like I, I believe, and I think you believe that if they actually sat down and played the game, they would enjoy it. I don't know if they'd be able to get over their like sort of undercurrent of embarrassment that they're playing a game like this. But how do you even like get there with them to begin with? How do you persuade them? I mean, you're not going to say what think- you just said, right? I, I don't think there's any distance to travel. I think that some people really get into stuff and some people don't. But I think, you know, the breadth of games, I think you could convince anyone to sit down and play one of these games with you. And they may go scoff, scoff, scoff. But then by the end of it, they might go, oh, actually, mate, that was great. That was a lot better than I expected. It's just, I think there is part of the gaming mentality that you want everyone to be a gamer like you, and it's just not going to happen, right? And I think that's fine. So do you have a a copy of Niet? I do. All right. Um, Tell me, why we're going to play it this holiday season, and why the listeners should consider playing it too if they haven't. Because Nyet takes a sort of standard trick taker and makes it more, if that can be, about interacting, about choosing people who you trust to be on your side. And then we're going to play it because... It is a wonderful innovation upon a classic trope. It is a perfect game to play around the Christmas period because most people have a conception of what trick-taking games are and you only have to explain a couple of little wrinkles and then you can sit down and playing a trick-taking game at this time of year, I think, evokes memories past and Christmas is about nostalgia and trick-taking games are inherently nostalgic, I think. And this one is not just an exercise in nostalgia. It's a bloody good game too. Thank you for listening to this show and indulging our overweening nostalgia. If you would like to support the show, you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash 5G for D. And we both wish you a very Merry Christmas.